All right. So just one more uh, disclaimer. In, in addition to Sean, I'm not an expert on honeybees. And uh, I've also gathered a lot of images that I'm using off of the internet. Google's a wonderful thing. Um, a lot of the flower images are mine, but when they're not mine, I have something that either has the person's name if I knew who it was or it just says www. So that's my uh, giving credit to someone else instead of uh, you thinking that I took uh, pictures of everything. So what I want to do to present pollination, which is what I was asked to do, is talk a little bit about honeybee pollination. And I thought, um, as I was exploring this topic myself, that it's kind of important to know a little bit about what a bee, how it's composed. And, uh, and so we'll look a little bit about uh, worker bee anatomy. And I'm going to talk about bees in general, but really I'm talking about the worker bees. Uh, there are queen bees that are female. There are drones that are male that never leave the hive. The females never leave the hive except for when they're going to form a new hive. And then really what we see around pollinating are the worker bees and they're uh, sterile females. So when I talk about bees, I'm really just referring mostly to the worker bees. So anyway, this is kind of an outline of the different topics that we'll go through. Look at foraging, we'll look a little bit about what flowers get from bees and some of their adaptations and then how bees communicate with each other. So there's a lot of parts to a bee, and we're not going to memorize all these. There's no quiz afterwards. But the things I've circled are the ones that I thought were most important. And uh, we have the mouth part, which is useful for sucking up nectar. And this is kind of worth exploring. The nectar will come down into the crop. And the crop is also called the honey stomach. The bee forages and it collects a lot of nectar and it has to put that somewhere. When that crop is completely full, it can weigh almost as much as the, as the bee itself. So it can hold about 70 milligrams of nectar if you know your milligrams, you can be impressed with that. If it gets hungry, there's actually a little uh, valve here and it can open up that valve and push some of that nectar into the rest of its digestive system and get uh, fuel from it. Otherwise, it keeps that nectar here to take back into the hive. There's a pollen basket on the legs, and we'll look at that a little bit more for collecting pollen. And then these parts in green are some important parts of the bee that aren't really used for uh, foraging, but important products are produced from those that we think of when we think about bees. And uh, and it takes energy to produce those products. It takes materials to produce those products. And so those products are indirectly the product of pollination and foraging. Life history, really briefly. Uh, after the egg is laid, it takes about 21 days to go from the egg stage to where the pupa, the larva, hatches out and it looks like what we think of as a bee. And so, you know, not a real important time in terms of the things I'm going to talk about tonight, but think about in terms of the total lifespan of a bee, uh, three weeks are spent in this pupal stage. Um, then is the house bee stage. After the bee emerges from the pupa and uh, looks like what we call a bee, it spends about another three weeks inside the hive without ever going outside the hive. And it has various tasks. It, it cleans. It cleans the cell that it was in. It cleans the surrounding cells. It helps the foragers who are out collecting nectar get that nectar and put it into the honeycombs. It has various uh, tasks that it does, including guarding and uh, ventilating the hive. And uh, here's where two of these products come into place. Uh, from that gland that was up near the bee's head, the bee secretes royal jelly. And if you've heard of royal jelly, royal jelly is the substance that when a, a larva first hatches, um, those larvae are fed royal jelly. And they're fed royal jelly for about the first two or three days. And then their diet is changed. There's, uh, they start being fed what's called uh, bee bread, which is a mixture of pollen and honey. And they'll be fed that for the remainder of their time that they're a larva until they pupate, unless you're a queen. And if you're a queen, instead of being given just enough royal jelly to get you through for a couple of days, you're saturated in it. And that saturation of yellow jelly is what makes a female egg, as it's developing, develop all the way to become a queen instead of developing to become a worker bee. So genetically, a worker bee and a queen are identical, but a worker bee ends up being sterile because it didn't have enough royal jelly to make its reproductive system complete. And uh, the other substance, we know that uh, honey comes in honeycombs. So honey is, is produced in honeycombs. Those honeycombs are made out of wax, and that wax comes from somewhere. And on the bottom of the bees, they actually have some glands of these end segments that produce these little scales of wax. 
So if they're eating honey and they can use that sugar in their body, convert it, rearrange the chemical structures, secrete wax, and then they'll carry those wax flakes from their legs up to their mouth and chew on it. Or because bees are very social, other bees will come up and actually help them chew off these wax flakes. And then they mix that with their saliva and put it back out as the wax where they need it for building the honeycomb. So the filled bee stage, um, this is really where pollination biology takes place. So another, uh, we had three weeks as a pupa, another three weeks spent inside the hive, and then there's about 10 to 14 days in the summer when a bee's out foraging. And at the end of those 35 days uh, total, as an adult life cycle, its wings become tattered, it can't do its job anymore, and it will fly back to the hive, and the other bees recognize that it's on its way out, and they see it to the door. And so that's the end of the bee's life. In wintertime, those bees can hibernate, and they can live longer periods of time. But during the summer, when they're most active, um, it's about, again, 10 to 14 days that they're actually foraging. So the next time you get stung by a bee and you're feeling bad, right, because that stinger comes out and it leaves its guts behind, um, it was just a matter of days before it was going to go anyway. <laughs> that doesn't make the sting hurt less, right? Um, I guess that's a crass way of looking at it, but it's interesting as you think about uh, everything that a bee does and what a short period of time it actually spends outside of the hive compared to its entire life cycle. So if we look at this in terms of this, these 14 days, what is the bee doing? It's foraging. And what does the bee forage for? One of the things that it collects is water. So everything needs water to live. Bees will use that water back in the hive to help cool, like an evaporative cooler. As the water evaporates, it helps cool down the hive in the summertime. And they also need it to mix with honey. Honey's thick. And uh, they, on purpose, evaporate out the liquid off of the nectar so it will become thicker. But when it comes time to use it, they need it thin again. So they'll add the water to the honey to make it thin so they can drink it and feed the larvae and the other things they do with it. So they also forage for resins. And the resins are produced by a lot of different things. If you know, um, it's pine cone season right now. You can get the pinion pine nuts and they have the resin on them. Uh, gymnosperms, a lot of pine trees have that uh, thick resin. A lot of uh, flowering plant trees, this is a birch bud. And the little shiny dots on here and the glistening crystals on the stem here are resin. And the bees will collect those resins and they bring them back to their hive. And they create a substance that uh, we call propolis. And uh, I'm not into, uh, what do you call it, the, the home medicine? Uh, yeah, homeopathic medicines and things. And, um, but for those who are, you can buy this, and, uh, and I'm not too sure what uh, all of the uses that it might be applied for. But uh, one of the things to think about, you can see it actually comes in different colors, and that's because it's chemically it's very different. We have a common name for it. If you're collecting your resin from a pine tree, it's going to have a different chemical composition to it than if it came from a birch tree. And so really, the bees don't discriminate. They get the resin from where it's available and use it as they need to. And one of the things that the bees will use it for, um, this was an example that I, I came across in my reading, but if you suppose a mouse got into your beehive and the mouse was stung, it died, bees are really clean and they're very good about taking their own waste out, but a mouse is pretty big for a bee to get out of the hive. But they can encase it in propolis and pretty much it just mummifies and then it's, it's inert, it's, it's separated from the rest of the hive. And so they use that as a way to um, enhance the sanity of their hives. So, well, we'll leave it at that. Okay, um, so what do bees get from flowers? Well, most of us know, they get nectar. And uh, they get a lot of nectar. Uh, bee inside that crop, I said it would hold about 70 milligrams. They have to visit somewhere between 100 to 1,500 flowers to get that 70 milligrams. And of course that's going to depend on the size of the flower. This is one of the flowers I actually do research on. And that open flower is really tiny compared to the bee, so it's not giving very much nectar. But the field that I was at um, was covered with bees. And when bees go out foraging, um, some of you may have heard they're very 
consistent. When they start visiting a flower that has a good nectar reward, they visit that same flower for a period of time until the nectar depletes itself. And then they'll move on to a different species of flower. And uh, that 70 milligrams, um, again, if I did the math right, that's like 0 0.00124 teaspoons. Okay? So if we carry that on, it takes about 700 visits back and forth to fill up your crop and come back to the hive to get one teaspoon of nectar. And that nectar is 80% water, 20% sugar, and honey is about 18% water. Er, excuse me. Yeah, about 18% water and honey. So that means a lot of the water that they're bringing back in that nectar actually has to evaporate to get what we call honey. It would take about 2,800 visits back and forth to the hive to get a teaspoon of honey. Um, so that's an amazing amount of work that our bees are doing for us. Um, here's a bee. It's covered with pollen. But it's not searching for pollen right now. In addition to being specific to species as they go out and forage, they're also specific for whether they're gathering pollen or nectar. If they're after nectar, they focus on nectar and they don't worry about pollen. If they're after pollen, then they focus on pollen and they don't worry about nectar. But this bee's uh, proboscis is down getting nectar and the pollen on its body is just a byproduct of where it's visiting. So of course, from nectar we get honey. And uh, I think I've told you all the interesting facts about honey. Does anybody have any interesting facts about honey you want to share? All right. Good stuff, right? So they also forage for pollen. And I've mentioned that. But the pollen is an important source. We know that uh, honey has sugar in it. As the bees collect that nectar, they add their digestive enzymes that takes them to complex sugars and break them down to simple sugars. And those digestive enzymes also help eliminate the things or make it so that bacteria can't grow in it. And uh, they collect the pollen because the pollen's a really important source for proteins. And those proteins are needed for feeding the larva. After those two or three days that they get royal jelly, they're going to be fed mostly on the bee bread, which is mostly pollen, mixed with a little bit of honey. And this is early springtime, and you see the bees visiting the flowers, and we think about pollination, and most of us probably assume that they're, they're foraging for nectar. But if you look closely, you can see on his back leg here the little pollen pellet from his pollen basket. So he's not going after nectar, he's going after pollen. Or she, I'm saying he, these are she's, right? Um, Maple trees, not very showy flowers. Many of us probably even overlook the flowers that are on maple trees. When springtime comes out, the leaves are just barely starting to emerge. Go out by the maple trees and you can hear the buzz of the bees. And uh, you'll see the bees. And at this time, even though maples can uh, produce nectar, they also have a lot of pollen. And this bee's collecting pollen. And this one's on his way to another flower. Um, Again, if we look at the pollen here, this really kind of drives home how specific, species-specific bees are in their foraging. These are the pollen pellets that were removed, uh, packed into the, the cells. So the honeycomb also around where the larvae are, are developing, that's where they'll store the, the bee bread. And if the bees were mixing, if they were collecting just randomly from any of the flowers that were out there and mixing all of that pollen together, we kind of expect all these pellets to be uniform in color, whatever color that was. But what you see is yellow pellets and orange pellets and grayish pellets, maybe some blue pellets in here. Pollen is all sorts of different colors, and the fact that those pellets are all one color shows you that the bees are being very uh, species specific in terms of what flowers they're visiting when they're out foraging. And again, uh, we use and market uh, these byproducts for various uses. So I talked a little bit about what the bees get from the flowers. So now it's time to think a little bit about what do the flowers get from the bees. And to understand this, you have to know a little bit about uh, plant biology. So this is a cherry flower. And I've sectioned through it with a razor blade. And uh, we need to just identify the male and the female parts of the flower. So um, sterile parts, those are our sepals, the green, the petals. And then these long, 
white structures with yellow at the top, those are the male parts. So those are our stamens. The yellow parts are called anthers, and that's what's producing the pollen. So the bee is collecting pollen from the anthers, and the anther is what contains the male reproductive system. So the sperm or the gametes are inside of the pollen grains. And in order for that to complete reproduction, the pollen grain has to find the female structure of the plant. And here we have a, that's going to again mature into a cherry, but right now it's a little ovary with an ovule inside of it, a single seed. And here's the stigma, and you can see some yellow attached to it. And so there's some pollen grain sticking to that. The pollen will grow a tube down, and then the, it'll end up fertilizing the ovule, and we'll have a mature seed, and in a couple of months we'll have a ripe cherry. So the bees, or excuse me, the flowers, are being aided in the reproductive biology here. And it would be really good... You say, well, why doesn't the flower just put its pollen onto its own stigma and be done with it? And there are some plants that do that, but you have to remember that in biology, genetic variation is good. We look out among us, we don't all look the same. We have genetic variation in our population. We're not allowed to marry our sisters or our cousins, right? But genetic variation is good, and it's good in, in Mother Nature's world also. And uh, so what we would hope is that as the bees are visiting flowers, that they're promoting this outcrossing, the carrying of pollen from one flower to the stigma on a different flower, and that would be useful. Um, sometimes there's cheating. Honeybees themselves are facultative cheaters, and uh, you can see the honeybee here with its proboscis inside a hole in these blueberry flowers. So it's not aiding that flower at all in terms of the flower's reproduction. So I'm going to call that cheating. Um, honeybees will do this if there's a hole already in the flower, but those holes weren't made by honeybees. They're made by carpenter bees. So if you're from the southeastern United States or California, you can see these big black like bumblebees that uh, make their homes in pergolas and arbors and fence posts. Uh, they're the culprits here. And they don't have any problem at all about cheating. And the bees come along and they say, ooh, there's an open source. They want sugar, and they're going to find it the easiest way they can. In the case of blueberries, it's interesting to note that they think even though the honeybees are cheating, um, it actually does aid reproduction in, in, in the blueberries because more bees come and visit the flowers, and some of them try visiting the way they're supposed to, and that still enhances the overall crop production in the blueberries. So what I want to talk about is a little bit about the flower side again of, of pollination and think about some adaptation, some of the strategies that flowers have that promote outcrossing, that promote genetic variation. And uh, we think of these as adaptations, but if you really stop and think about it, um, adaptations come from mutations, and mutations are random. So a plant has a mutation that changes its flower just a little bit. That's a random event. And whether or not we see that mutation carried on from generation to generation depends on how well the bees actually respond to it. So I get kind of excited about this aspect of pollination biology, the things that the plants are doing. But I really have to stop and give credit to the bees because they're the driving force for us seeing this kind of variation. And uh, I thought it would be good to give an example. Okay, so here's your chance. Everybody's wanting to do this secretly. Um, you've all wanted to be a bee, right? Okay, so, so now you're all bees. And uh, this is the, the forage crop we have this year. So how many of you would forage on this kind of a flower? Raise your hands. All right, so that's a pretty good show. We could probably ensure the survival of white chocolate chip flowers from that kind of foraging. Um, but in the reproductive process, our DNA crosses over with other DNA, and without going into all the details, mutations happen, changes happen. And that's just part of, of, of life and life cycles. And so we have a mutation, and I'm going to push the mutation button here. And now we have a slightly different kind of flower. So how many of you would forage for this? Okay, I, I think I see more hands. How many of you would forage for this that wouldn't forage for the first one? Okay, see there's some hands coming up there. So we could be pretty sure that a mutation in this direction would be carried on into the population. Um, sometimes mutations are advantageous and they'll be selected for, and then we would call those adaptations. But the flower didn't do this on purpose, but it's, we start to see it in the later generations because the bees are selecting for it. So let's push the button again. 
Okay. So who's going to forage? All right. And that's the way Mother Nature is. Some mutations are advantageous, and those are selected for. We see those passed on to later generations, and some of them won't be selected for. Um, I didn't see any takers, so we're probably not going to see this carried on to the next generation. Reproduction isn't going to be successful, and uh, we've lost that from the gene pool. So here are some of the different adaptations that we find in plants. Um, some of these might be familiar to you and some of them may be a little bit less familiar. But the first one is honey guides. So this is a catalpa tree, those trees that look like they have great big bean leaves and bean pods hanging from them. They're quite common in the area. And uh, you can notice the guides here that actually help the bees, here's a bee entering in the flower, um, know whether, how to enter into the flower. And the other thing that's shown here is this prolonged display. Can you see that the honey guides, the yellow parts are darker in some of the flowers? When the flower first opens, the yellow dots are really bright. And that's the signal that there's nectar in there. And after a short period of time, um, maybe a day or so, it would vary depending on what species we're looking at, those yellow marks turn dark. And that's likely after the nectar's been removed from the flower. So from a distance, keeping all of our flowers on the plant's a good thing because something from a distance can key in, visually say, there's, there's a flower, I'm gonna go over there and visit it. And then the bees learn pretty quickly when they're here to spend their time visiting the flowers that are yellow in color on the honey guides and not spend their time on the ones that are darker in color. So we can have a temporal, that means time, separating the sexes in time. A lot of flowers are what we call perfect flowers. They have both male and female parts all in the same flower. And, and this sunflower, its flowers are that way. So we call this a sunflower. It's really a sun inflorescence. There are hundreds of flowers here, little teeny itty bitty flowers. And a, a dandelion, when you look at a dandelion, every one of those little tongue-like things sticking out is really a flower. It's not a single flower, it's a whole collection of flowers. And as the yellow dots on here are the pollen, so that's the male. And this flower, the male parts develop first and then the female parts develop later. So back here where you don't see the yellow, it's already past the male stage, now it's the female stage. So a bee, when it visits this flower, usually lands towards the outside and it works its way towards the inside. So it'd be carrying pollen from another flower and it would visit the stigmas here and put that pollen on the stigmas on the females here and then it would come over and start collecting the pollen here and then fly over to another flower and repeat that process. So it's helping to promote outcrossing by having the male and the female parts mature at different times. Um, spike inflorescences, elongated inflorescences, do kind of the same thing with the flowers maturing from the bottom up towards the top. So here's a bee visiting this uh, relative of mint and uh, it started at the bottom and it's going to work its way up to the top with the male parts produced first and then the female parts. So maybe at this level or over here on the digitalis, over on this level we would have the uh, male parts producing pollen and down here the male parts would already be finished with that and we'd have the female parts exposed. So a bee starts at the bottom and it works its way towards the top which would promote outcrossing again. Some plants also separate the sexes physically. So these are maples. Can you see any difference between the flowers on the left and the right? So you can see a larger female organ here. And these male organs, they really actually never even mature. It looks like a stamen. It has an anther at the tip, but it really doesn't produce pollen anymore. It's sterile. And over here, you can see the elongated anthers, and the female part is still there, but it actually aborts too. It's sterile. And so by having, sometimes on the same tree, you'll have the sexes separated into different flowers, or in some plants, they're actually on completely different plants where you have the male flowers versus the female flowers. But that would be another mechanism of promoting outcrossing that would be um, favorable to the plants and driven by bees. Um, symmetry, 
So something like a dandelion, you can slice it like an apple pie in many different planes. Um, other things like ourselves, there's only one way we could slice ourselves and have a mirror image. And flowers that have this single plane of symmetry to them are nice for bees because it shows the bee the best way to land in the flower to make sure that pollination takes place. For the bee, it's thinking about how to get the reward, and the plant is, is uh, going to benefit by making sure that its male parts touch the female parts. So neither one of these are honey, honey bees, but I had, to, I had to expand a little bit to get the photos. A bumblebee on this side, and then some kind of a, a bee. We'll leave it at that. Riley could tell you, maybe, or Sean. Um, this is something you ought to try if you're out hiking around and you come across the Opuntia tat prickly pear cacti. Um, as long as you wipe your finger in at least two flowers so that you help pollination take place, then Mother Nature won't mind. But the st stamens on here are sticking straight up, and as soon as a bee, and there actually is one, that's what that brown spot is here. This is dark, but this big brown spot here is a bee. As soon as a bee lands in there, in response to the touch, those stigmas start to curl over. And so the stigmas, or excuse me, the stamens wrap around that bee, and the bee ends up having to fight its way out and gets just completely covered in, in pollen from head to toe. And uh, that's called a thigmoplastic, but we'll just call it touch movement. And it's a response to touch that causes the stamens to move. So you can put your finger in there and the stamens will start doing a little worm-like crawl. Um, poor dispersed pollen. Again, this isn't something that we would see in a humming, uh, a honeybee flower because honeybees don't buzz pollinate, but bumblebees do. Um, things like tomatoes have all of their pollen released from just a little hole at the tip. So when the bee, uh, bumblebee comes over to these flowers, the pore ends up right over its belly and then it vibrates the middle segment really rapidly and that just vibrates all the pollen out into one pile in its belly and then it will comb that over to the pollen baskets on its legs. And so it's a very effective way to quickly gather pollen in plants that have adapted to, to that kind of morphology. Um, tension trigger pollination, this is something that you'd find in the bean family, or peas, beans, and other legumes. There's a banner petal, which is held upright, and then there's two petals on the side that are called the wings, and then two petals are fused together, and they call that the keel. It's like the tip of a canoe or the tip of a boat. And inside of that is where we have the stamens and the stigma, the female structure, and initially that's actually pressed downwards. You can even do this on little flowers like uh, um, alfalfa, which is still in bloom right now in some places. Go to a little alfalfa flower and touch it with something small, and you can see it flip up. So this is under tension and when a bee lands on this, the weight of the bee sets off the trigger and it flips up and whacks the bee right in its chest. And it's an effective way again of, of scattering pollen that would aid in outcrossing. Um, this is from the southeastern United States, the, the mountain laurels, if you're familiar with them. Each one of the stamens is set back into a little cavity. You can see the little pokies on here, that's where the stamens are located. And when a bee lands on those stamens, again, they spring forward. Um, reorientation, the scientific term is resupination. But if you think about a pea flower again, it has this banner flower, the orientation for that is to have the banner at the top. And so for plants that grow with the roots in the ground and their tips pointed upwards, just like you'd expect, that banner will be upwards. But on something like a wisteria, the tip of the plant is actually hanging down. It's like a cluster of grapes. So this is the tip of the plant, which means the banner, if it's growing the way that you just think it would based on orientation of the plant, the banner should be pointing downwards. But the bees expect that banner to be upwards. And so what happens in development of these flowers, the entire flower rotates 180 degrees. So what would normally be a downward pointing flower is pointed the way anything that's looking at the flower would expect it to be. Um, multiple combinations. This is in a, a legume again. But you can see a spike in fluorescence. You can see the uh, showy display from a distance, different color of flowers changing as, as the different parts are available, the nectar versus the pollen. Uh, these would actually have that bilateral symmetry, spring uh, trigger pollination, so lots of different things combined. Wow. 
Um, one final part about foraging, color. Um, some of us know a little bit about the color, the things that bees can see. Um, this diagram isn't perfect, but it shows the first important point is that the where we shift over where we can see more red, the peak for bees is over to the left. And so they really don't see red very well. There's been some really elegant studies to show, show that bees don't discriminate red just by itself. They, um, they tend not to see it. And so a lot of books will actually talk about bees not being able to pollinate or that bees don't pollinate red flowers. Red flowers we usually think of being hummingbird pollinated. But no one told this bee. And uh, if you pay attention, you'll notice that bees do, in fact, visit red flowers. Even though they can't see red, they can see the contrast between red and the background. And they'll still key in on red flowers, especially if there's a pollen or a nectar reward. And they use these other sensual cues uh, of uh, sense uh, cues of uh, smell and things like this to find what they're looking for. Um, you also notice this peak that we don't have in our eyes at all, which is the ultraviolet range. So we can't see light in these wavelengths, but bees can. And uh, some flowers have used that effectively um, for what we call bee purple or bee violet. These colors are arbitrary down here. If you take pictures with UV light, because we can't see it, there's no way to show you the color on the film unless someone digitally enhances the color. So, so don't think that the bees really seen red here. Whatever they're seeing, they're seeing a pattern, but it's not necessarily colors that you're seeing when you look on here. But this is what we would see under normal light, and this is what the bee sees. This is in the buttercup family. This is in the evening rim primrose family, completely unrelated plants. Um, these are both from the sunflower family. Your lowly dandelion actually has some pretty good uh, bee violet going on. And this is from the rose family. So again, independently uh, evolved in separate groups have been this ability to attract bees, show them where the reward is, key them into where the reward is through the use of pigments that we can't discern with our own eyes. So how do honeybees communicate? Um, I'm going to go about three minutes over time, Larry. But I promise I won't go more than that. So this is really where the dancing part of the um, lecture comes in. So get some popcorn, enjoy the movie. A healthy hive of honeybees functions like a perfect and fluid organism. At the center of all activity is the queen, an egg-laying machine. The queen is actually a slave to her duties, laying up to 2,500 eggs a day, as many as two million in her lifetime. The worker bees are all female and make up the bulk of the colony. In a typical hive of 30,000 bees, only about 100 are males, called drones. With oversized eyes and bulky bodies, drones are not equipped to gather pollen or nectar and must rely on the workers to feed them. The invaluable work bees do takes its toll. In the summer, workers only live around 30 days, literally work to death. The hive is constantly replenished with new generations of bees, ready to go to work from the moment they hatch. When a bee is three weeks old, she becomes a forager and will spend the rest of her short life collecting nectar and pollen. She'll fly up to three miles away and, amazingly, always return to the same hive. When she discovers an abundant pollen source, she'll recruit other foragers through a most unusual form of communication, a dance. She informs the other bees that food is available and that food is in such and such a direction from the hive and is at such and such a distance away from the hive. And those pieces of information, distance and direction, are encoded symbolically in movements and sounds that she produces. Turn right at 100 feet. Take a left at 50 feet. 
The waggle dance is the only known symbolic language that exists outside the realm of humans and lower primates. There's really nothing that compares to the dance language of the honeybee. It stands as one of the seven wonders of the animal behavior world. Okay, so mostly accurate, but not quite. Um, this is who we have to thank for understanding the waggle dance. Uh, Carl von Frisch was awarded the Nobel Prize for his work on honeybees in the 1970s. And uh, he carried out a bunch of really elegant studies. He wrote a book that was published in the 60s that uh, is really it's fascinating. It's a thick book, but it's called the, the Dance Language and Orientation of Bees. And he goes over all of the work that he did throughout most of his career and summarizes it in a way that um, is really accessible. Uh, laymen could understand the book without needing to know a lot of technical details. It really is fascinating. But these experiments that he did were really simple. He took little pots of, of sugar water and he trained bees to them. And he was the first person to really demonstrate the color, what colors bees could see by training them to different colors and then setting that color out with other things and seeing how the bees were constant for those particular colors, which ones they could discriminate and which ones they couldn't. Um, he developed a numbering system for his bees so that he and the students who were working with him could make these observations. They painted different colors in different arrangements on the bees' bodies, and then that's how they would record. So in the field, they could observe a bee visiting a flower or their little sugar water pot, and then back in the hive, they would know that it was the exact same bee. And so by looking and experimenting and placing their sugar in different places and then watching what the bees did back in the hive, he was actually able to decode the the waggle dance. And the part in the video that was misleading was the turn left, turn right. Have you ever taken a beeline home? And usually we do have to do some turning right because we're humans. But that means to go straight. And that's what the bees do. They go straight. And uh, there's nothing in the waggle dance that tells turning left and turning right. But it does. Um, this is the circular dance. If the nectar source is within maybe 800 feet or so of the hive, they'll do a round dance. And uh, that tells the bees that it's close, but it doesn't tell them anything about where it is, and the bees just kind of search over in the general area until they find it. If it's longer than that, again, up to about three miles, they do the waggle dance. And it's at figure eight, and whenever they go in the straight direction through the center, they wiggle their body and it's the frequency and intensity of that vibration that actually tells the other bees how far away the source is. And they can account for the train differences if it's on a mountain and they have to fly down the mountain, um, over hills, uh, things like that. The bees can actually incorporate all of that. The other thing that they incorporate is actually the direction um, at which the honey is relative to the sun. So here's the hive. Here's the sun. If the honey source, or the nectar source, I should say, was in a direct line between the hive, then the waggle dance will be in a perfect direction straight up. If it's on the other direction, then the waggle on the way down. And if it's at an angle, a 60 degree angle, it will be exactly a 60 degree angle that they go relative to what the sun is. And they can also do this on cloudy days because bees can sense uh, the light through the clouds. They can do it with very little light, just seeing light in the distance, not even the sun. Um, they've done experiments in dark containers with just a little bit of blue light shining through. And the bees can tell from the polarization of the light uh, where the sun is. And then they can also account if the same bee, and sometimes these bees the same bee will do a waggle dance for an hour. Does the sun stand still for an hour? It doesn't. The sun's moving. And as the same bee does the waggle dance over the course of the hour, its angle of direction that it moves actually changes also. So bees have an incredible ability to sense time and ability to communicate that to their comrades. And uh, they use that communication so that the bees efficiently go to where the nectar is for that period of the day. So with that, um, I'll finish and we'll turn the time over.